I looked at some of the events of the late 50s and the 60s culminating in 1971 and 72, 71 being a major moment in Pakistan's history because of the division of the country in 1972 as the first year of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's uh, Pakistan had a natural disposition towards socialism or communism or was it sort of ill disposed towards these systems? Disposition to it's a very difficult. Of course, you know, the, the argument uh, for what the socialists were making, of course, was also based on a certain kind of teleology, a certain kind of reading of history. So I think at that level, saying a country like Pakistan that only got 9% of the industries of uh, United uh, British India, uh, did not have a very large uh, <clears throat> formal working class, right? China in 1949 has the revolution, the Maoist revolution, which is not based on industrial workers. So there's a different model that also arises. I mean, even under a constitutional framework, it was not very democratic. And I must say, and I know, don't know if you're, uh, this is blasphemous to say, but even under Jinnah, we first sort of got rid of uh, Poro's government in Sin. Uh, revolutions happen just uh, because of uh, the conditions there. There also has to be an organized group of people to lead them. And I don't think that was the politics and the economy. And that sort of those grievances um, and those resentment with the military rule, especially those 10 years of the uh, Ayub Khan uh, era, uh, had a very informative and a very uh, important uh, article in the early 70s on the third world state. And he says the kind of coalition between a, in a place and taking Pakistan's example, it's a more general argument. He looks at what you were saying, the sort of uh, landed elite, the bureaucracy and the military coming together as a tripartite kind of way in which a post-colonial, it's about the post-colonial state. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this new episode of Political Economy This Week with Asad Ijaz Bhatt on uh, New Wave Global. I'm joined by Mr. Kamran Asdar Ali, Professor of Anthropology at University of Texas at Austin. Uh, we'd be primarily talking about how communism and socialism shaped up in Pakistan, especially uh, early Pakistan in the 50s and 60s. You know, this uh, the idea for this discussion came from... Um, uh, a lot of debate that uh, started on the social media a few weeks ago, uh, which focused on uh, the outcomes that Bhutto's nationalization, uh, 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 outcomes that Bhutto's nationalization uh, 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 brought in Pakistan. And, you know, the, uh, the discussion was primarily centered on economics, but I would also want to focus on uh, political and social frameworks that brought about, you know, this... Uh, wave of communism in Pakistan and what led to its ultimate uh, discontinuation or, or perhaps its ultimate downfall in Pakistan. But first, let me uh, welcome um, uh, uh, Dr. 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 Kamran. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Uh, sir, I'm, uh, I was particularly intrigued about your book uh, that uh, sort of, I think, did a history of uh, communism in Pakistan, I think from 1947 to uh, uh, 1972 and uh, talked about, you know, class activism in Pakistan. Could you, you know, just for starters, could you uh, could you briefly tell us about uh, the thesis of that book? No, uh, thank you, Asad Sir. Thank you for having me. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, the book uh, actually was a kind of a labor of love for of many years. It came out in 2015, uh, some years now. And uh, the uh, the impetus was, of course, to record a part of Pakistan's history that is seldom acknowledged, right? I mean, mostly when we have history texts uh, in Pakistan, they are, uh, in most of the cases, uh, focused on a certain kind of Pakistan's uh, own nationalism in the sense of the Muslim nationalist history of uh, of the Muslim League in the 30s and 40s. But then after that, it is basically what we call focused on big men. So there's Jinnah, there's Liaka, there are other leaders, right? So it's basically also, and so certain kinds of histories are sort of sidelined in that, of course, labor history and the history of social movements, the history of the left, and of course, uh, history of women, of gender, of working classes, of all kinds of ways, you know, uh, the, uh, the national history project or the nationalist history project is very focused on particular kinds of themes, ideas, and personalities. 
So that was the sort of impetus. And what I did uh, just briefly, because we may not have a lot of time, is to look at the inception of the uh, Communist Party in Pakistan as a uh, as a sort of uh, uh, from 1947-48 onwards, which of course the Communist Party of Pakistan was uh, formed out of the Communist Party of India uh, after partition. Even the Communist Party was divided, and cadres came from India, and some were already here to create this uh, group, which initially was overground, which was a legal party, but had a lot of uh, uh, repression from the state. It was only banned in 1954, formally. And then I looked at some of the events of the late 50s and the 60s, culminating in 1971 and 72, 71 being a major moment in Pakistan's history because of the division of the country in 1972 as the uh, first year of Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto's uh, uh, rule in which there were major uh, labor strikes in and labor, labor struggles in especially Karachi and then later on in 73 onwards in Punjab as well. So that's where it is clear. So it's a kind of a hidden labor history, but trying to trace the history of left and especially the history of the Communist Party, but also its evolution, its fracture, its divisions, in the 50s and 60s. So are you essentially saying that the Communist Party was the only real communist group in Pakistan uh, as the country was formed? Because we see that, you know, there were other uh, political parties also that sort of loosely adhered to communism. Uh... No, but that is much later. I mean, initial period, <clears throat> what we see is that, uh, of course, Muslim League was the largest party in Pakistan in 1947 of course within muslim league itself there were various factions and there were some more progressive people like miaf tahruddin who yes. later on formed the uh, pakistan times in rose you know the uh, uh, and others as well and by the early 50s the muslim league had also divided into many groups there was jinnah muslim league mamdoud saab ki and then you know things like that so what i'm trying to suggest is that initially a lot of the left sort of adhered if not uh, completely as card carrying members, but uh, sort of a lot of the people who had progressive ideals sort of worked as uh, worked around the Communist Party, although they may not have. It's only later that uh, these uh, various kinds of more formal uh, groupings came up. Of course, in the late 50s, already uh, what we called Awami League of uh, Molana Bhashani had started. They were not, uh, they were sort of progressive, but also nationalist. Even Sarwardi was part of that. And later on that and other groups coming together formed in the 1956-57 National Awami Party, which was sort of broadly left of center. So, I mean, on the formal politics, in terms of <clears throat> electoral politics, grouping started happening in the 50s. But as a uh, socialist communist group, uh, Communist Party of Pakistan uh, as a legal entity did exist <clears throat> from 1948 to 1954, I apologize. <clears throat> yeah, but, uh, and then, you know, things also evolved in that because it had to go underground after being banned. And in the 50s and 60s, they uh, the coalition was uh, basically the left cadre worked with different, more legal and formal parties like National Awami Party. Yeah. So, uh, so do you think if you look at, you know, the circumstances in which Pakistan was formed, do you think Pakistan, you know, a lot of people say that Pakistan was uh, naturally inclined to a more feudalistic sort of uh, a state structure dominate, dominated by feudals. Do you think Pakistan had a natural disposition towards socialism or communism, or was it sort of ill-disposed towards these systems? Look, since uh, the issue of natural natural disposition, so it's a very difficult. Of course, you know the, the argument uh, for what the socialists were making, of course, was also based on a certain kind of teleology, a certain kind of reading of history. The idea was that you know. Uh, first, uh, you have to have industrialization, then you have to have to the proletariat, and then the proletariat have to struggle initially in a sort of a bourgeois. So those kinds of stages of history kind of thesis, as uh, we are well aware. 
I mean, even in the sense that if you look at 1857, Marx writes about 1857, about the horrors of how the British crushed the, uh, what we call the War of Independence, the British call the mutiny. But he said that this had to happen because from the ashes of this will rise a certain kind of a modernization, industrialization, the proletariat, and then hopefully, you know, so it's a very interesting teleology that the Marx, more sort of traditional, or I would say more sort of, uh, the formal uh, Marxist uh, uh, discussion on history has. So I think at that level, saying a country like Pakistan that only got 9% of the industries of uh, United uh, British India uh, did not have a very large uh, <clears throat> formal working class, right? And it was still a much a rural, uh, uh, rural economy. Uh, based on the kinds of structures of uh, power and and uh, that you are talking about feudalism and everything and also uh, <clears throat> the largest amount of labor concentration was in places like railways or in east pakistan in the tea uh, in the tea gardens right so we didn't even have a large industry i mean in karachi apart from the port workers there were there was uh, very few, uh, there were some cement factories, there were some construction concerns. Actually, the Communist Party was most involved there amongst the port workers or the municipal workers or the or the beery workers, right? Or the postal workers, so service industry, beery, you know, the, the sort of uh, the cigarette workers, things like yes. that. So we didn't have a large of industry, even in Faisal, then, then Lailpur, Faisalabad, there was some textile mill, there was some, you know, Kada, there was sort of attack oil, so, but it was a very, uh, so to say that it was ripe for a socialist kind of uh, uh, revolution uh, is, we, one can't say, according to the older history. Of course, China in 1949 has the revolution, the Mao's revolution, which is not based on industrial workers. So there's a different model that also arises. So now that that is one part of it the other part of it whether pakistan was ripe or not one has to say that what kind of leadership the initial uh, state uh, or the the leadership of pakistani muslim pakistan muslim league gave to uh, i mean even under a constitutional framework it was not very democratic and i must say and i know don't know if you're uh, this is blasphemous to say but even under jinnah we first sort of got rid of uh, Koro's government in Sin. Then we got rid of uh, Khan Saab's government in uh, what FB. was then NWFP, right? And he would have gone after Mamdot as well, which Liaquat Ali Khan did. In all these three places, Balochistan was yet not a state, uh, a province. And in 1948, it was forcefully incorporated into Pakistan uh, through a semi, uh, semi uh, military uh, threat. So Balochistan was, right? So I'm just saying that there were also these centralization uh, kind of processes and undemocratic processes of bringing in governor's rule uh, right from the beginning, right from the beginning, under various kinds of pretext of, you know, corruption and the kind of language you hear today, you know, these people are corrupt and they can't be trusted or they have made money out of evacuee property in Mamdo's court case. So I think there is both things. One is sort of the... The objective condition in Pakistan, of course, the majority of the people were poor. The majority of the people were uh, had uh, needed resources for living, for education, for health. But the state itself was basically involved in other kinds of intrigues and, of, like you said, perhaps consolidating their own privileges rather than thinking of uh, the disenfranch the the poor and the and the uh, you know the underprivileged side. Right? So. I'll leave it there. I, it's not a clear cut answer, but because, you know, I don't think that uh, revolutions happen just uh, because of uh, the conditions there. There also has to be an organized group of people to lead them. And I don't think that was even with the nascent Communist Party, we didn't have, although they were aspiring to it, they didn't have that kind of leadership yet in place. And there are reasons we can talk about it. So, Kamran uh, uh I know you have a very large body of work focusing on the left in India. Um, so, but we do see that, uh, you know, if you see later politics in the subcontinent, India became, you know, during the Cold War, became part of the, the Soviet bloc and there were leftist uh, socialist tendencies in India. And Pakistan during Ayub Khan's era, of course, I'll take you to the 60s now, we were, we had these... Uh, 
we were more sort of uh, tilted towards centralized economic planning, you know, those five year plans that started in 1955. And, you know, during the 60s, we were perhaps, I think, growing at a at an at average annual growth rate of more than 6%, uh, especially in, in that period between 1960 and 1965, we had phenomenal growth rates. Absolutely. And and so so that was, you know, you know, centralized economic planning. And of course, those planning institutions are also being set up by and the planning commission, which were at the forefront of Pakistan's planning. And so Pakistan was all poised for, you know, centralized economic planning for uh, for more times to come. But then we saw sort of an implicit discontinuation of these five year economic plans during Bhutto's era, but Bhutto nationalized the uh, industries. So if you see this uh, overall sort of bent towards leftism and socialism during the 60s and perhaps even in, in the early 70s. Do you think that this was like a sort of a regional inclination that Pakistan was also part of or were Pakistan's uh, circumstances peculiar that led led it towards um, centralized economic planning in the 60s? Yeah, um, Asa uh, uh, thank you. I mean, you, you, your training in economics, you would know these things better, but there's several factors, right? I mean, historically, of course, Pakistan... Uh, tilted. I mean, the Indian communist uh, or socialist uh, experiment is very different. In 1958, already the Communist Party of India wins election in Kerala. Yeah. And nine, you know, so already Namrudripad is there, and then and there is a certain kind of coexistence with Nehru because of his own sort of uh, so broader socialistic tendencies and 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 investment, state investment in education and and in health and in various kinds of. Uh, giving subsidies to various kinds of social sectors. But leaving India aside, that's a different issue. In Pakistan, of course, from the early 50s, still towards a more sort of a coalition with the United States in the evolving Cold War, with CENTO and CETO and all those kinds of things. And by Ayub Khan coming in, one of the things that growth also manages is that early, very early in 58 and 59, uh, General Burki was, I think, the health and labor uh, minister under him, they already have very sort of, uh, labor had to be controlled. There was a lot of labor. I mean, 50s history, we can go in, you know, every day uh, there was a government change and all kinds of ways in yeah. which people were asking for democratic change. And eventually, you know, Skandar Mirza has this kind of coup. And then within a few days, Ayub Khan comes into power, removing Skandar Mirza as well. And no elections happened because that was the anticipation that after 1956, there will uh, constitution, there'll be an election and a popular election. And everyone says we would have won. Who knows who would have won? But the point is, but labor had to be controlled. So what happens is a very draconian sort of uh, push towards labor. And within that, of course, there is space of state capital, actually. PIDC is formed already in 58, 52, 53. And a lot of big names of your industrial captains of the era were given a seat on that uh, forum. And basically, a lot of industrialization happens in the 50s and in the 60s is through state investment, right? I mean, basically, the state comes in, of course. And also with very, uh, uh, you you talk absolutely from 60s and 65, you know, I mean, the, the Papinek basically talks about this notion as a robber baron because the argument that Mehbub al who later on becomes a progressive economist, it's basically trickle down, right? You know, if we have industrialization, people will be employed. We control labor, we put in funds, we have a, a liberal uh, uh, monetary policy and international funds come in. It's the, basically the World Bank support. What happens in 65 is 65 war happens, which is, you know, mistake or not. And the World Bank money dries up. And then we have floods in 66, 67. And that's where the sputtering of the miracle starts happening. And by 67, 68, you talked about Pied, Pied's journal, uh, Pakistan Development Review. There's a 67 or 68 article, which really shows that the decade that is shown as this really growth thing and industrialization and the productivity and the participation of uh, labor in the formal uh, working um, in the in people in the formal working force, but the discrepancy between haves and have nots, the sort of gap between the rich and poor also increases, right? That's why this whole argument that Bhutto makes about the, you know, the 20 families and this and that. So I think already economists in places like that you have mentioned that are creation of this growth are thinking are looking at that. And by 68, 69, it's very clear that that uh, that development miracle did not have a much uh, the kind of trickle down or the kind of 
egalitarian spread or the kind of uh, raising uh, poverty levels, it didn't have that kind of effect. The concentration of wealth remained at a certain point. I mean, these are also, that's why in the late 60s, you have people like Putto playing or flirting with the idea of socialism, right? Because yeah. then we are talking about Musawat and egalitarianisms and things like that. Even, even the right is talking about that because you couldn't do it. You couldn't have a popular mass-based movement without addressing some of the inequities that the system had produced in the 60s. Do you think, sir, uh, that the class divide that was sort of inherent into this region, given you know uh, the colonial sort of backdrop as well, do you think that, that those those kind of uh, class differences and those cracks were basically uh, sort of exposed by uh, early interventions by the military and that class divide basically deepened as uh, the military sort of consolidated its grip over uh, the politics and the economy? And that sort of those grievances um, and those resentment with the military rule, especially those 10 years of the uh, Ayub Khan uh, era basically led to, you know, the the, the communist and the socialist sort of uh, forces uh, consolidate power in Pakistan in the late 60s. Do you think I would be right yeah. in saying that? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that the, the latter, I mean, the idea of consolidation of power by the left, I think that's not there, right? I mean, uh, I mean, Bukto cannot be said entirely a person of the left, although he's left of center and he has support of a lot of the underground. No, what 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 I'm trying to say, and Hamza Alvi talks about it in a nine, early nine. Hamza Alvi, the uh, Pakistani sociologist, uh, British sociologist, uh, had a very informative and a very uh, important uh, article in the early seventies on the third world state, and he says the kind of coalition between in a in a place and taking Pakistan's example, it's a more general argument. He looks at what you were saying, the sort of uh, landed elite, the bureaucracy, and the military coming together as a tripartite kind of way in which a post-colonial, it's about the post-colonial state. Having said that, what I'm trying to suggest, and this may be a little contrarian, that the military rule was, of course, uh, uh, at some level, uh, uh, you know, undemocratic and everything, but under the, its economic issue was that it basically allowed, and this has happened with the United States in Latin America and others, that there are certain kind of growth uh, argument is made around uh, private uh, investments about you know uh, 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 f uh, financial openings and things like that but for that you need a certain kind of a, uh, heavy hand so what military played is to control those kinds of forces democratic or otherwise whether labor or otherwise so that a certain kind of space could be given to uh, investors uh, to uh, the captains of industry to basically unhindered uh, uh, sort of what they could say that of production, right? Without, uh, you know, all, all labor movement was crushed and everything. Like this is also Korea that happened. I mean, Korea had martial law or military rule till the 80s, right? I mean, this was the growth pattern in which uh, mm -hmm. a certain kind of uh, uh, industrial or capital-based growth was done, but what the military rule provide was the political cover for capital. That's sort of how you have to understand it structurally. What Ayub Khan did was given military cover or a kind of a heavy hand, a state cover, so that capital could have a free, a free hand without the kind of problems of uh, labor disputes or struggles or democratic norms or discussions and debate. Because in a, in a martial law or in a... So, but late 60s, all this sort of when this system collapses and the it's quite evident that the kind of distributive promises that were given did not come through. And also the issue of national rights. I said, yeah, we have to understand what also becomes because in 1950s, we already became one unit. What sort of late 60s does is also national rights, whether it's in Bengal, all the breaking up of the one unit system, yeah. right? So national rights, which is a politics of difference of identity and class issues, they come together in the politics against you. And then the emergence of phenomena like uh, uh, Bhutto in the West and Mujib in the East.
So they come together, the political economy and the sort of the politics of what I would say, politics of difference and identity or national. If you look at, and I'll just stop after this, if you look at the national 1970 election results, basically overwhelmingly, the uh, the populists had had uh, voted for groups that had uh, nationalist agendas. Look in in NWFP, JUI, they did, but so did NAP. Balochistan was all NAP. Uh, Bhutto had a certain kind of a Punjab Sindh thing, but a lot of his vote was also around Sindh. And Mujib sort of, apart from one seat, every other every seat in East Pakistan went to Mujib, which was a nationalist question. So the qu nationalities question comes back in Pakistan as a federal state in 1970 election. It is even the electoral politics shows it. Around populism as well, around sort of uh, distribution of rights as well, Bhutto's sort of whole thing. But I think that is also has to be understood that by the late 60s, the, 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 it was forcefully kept together that these kinds of, uh, you know, the, the military rule was not only keeping uh, labor in check, it was not only keeping the democratic uh, aspirations of the people in check, but it was also sort of forcing a unity where uh, amongst different groups, you know, because Muslim nationals said we are Muslims first, but what has the reality is that we are different peoples of Pakistan. We have different histories, different cultures, and that was forcefully kept together, especially with East Bengal, especially, and now you still see the, the simmering things in Balochistan. Sorry, I've gone more than you should, you want to uh, No, 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 no. I can that's... talk about the Bhutto era too, if you want, and that's not- No, no, that's perf perfectly all right. Uh, sir, uh, uh, yeah, I, 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 I jump to the Bhutto era now, you know, Pakistan breaks up in 1971. Uh, I don't want to focus too much on that, but post-1971, you know, Bhutto comes into power and ultimately nationalizes the industries. And of course, there's a lot of debate about what outcomes did that produce. Um, so, what do you think, you know, was the nationalization successful? Was it needed at that point? A lot of people also think that, you know, the idea was good. It could have been implemented, but maybe perhaps at a later stage. Um, do you think that the timing was wrong? Yeah, I mean, you know, the nationalization happens very early. It happens in February 1972. Bhutto just comes in as a... Uh, takes over power in uh, late December of 1971. So within a couple of months and, and Mubashir Hassan Saab and all. Dekhi, Mubatto comes in as a coalition of labor, peasant, uh, urban working, I mean, labor, urban working class, students, uh, sort of the broader sort of democratic forces. He has a sort of a populist element in it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, he has always said socialism is our economics and this and that. And then he does that. Now, some of it uh, in, in retrospect, one could say that some of that may have been in haste. There was also a pressure from below, a lot of pressure, because from the late 60s, uh, most places, but especially in large uh, place like uh, Karachi, uh, there was a labor struggle going on. There was absolutely in, during when Yahya comes into power. After Bhutto, there is uh, this whole, and then there is a much more sort of intensification amongst labor processes and saying, you know, this whole issue of Gharao, Jalao and things like that. And actually some left groups, and I'll be saying this, some left groups thought that this was, a and when 71 happens, that this is sort of the collapse of the state. And this is the insurrectionary moment that was in 1917s in Russia. This was the thesis. So let's intensify it and take over. So there was a lot of pressure there. Bhutto basically also does two things. One, he nationalizes, and then he also crushes the labor movement in June and in um, in site area in Karachi and in Lanti Korangi in October. Viciously uh, crushes it because he had to show the rate of the state. Also, within act, rather uh, despite that, within his own ministers. And within his own sort of close cabinet members or coalition members are some leftist uh, people like Miraj Mohammad Khan, who then is actually also um, put in jail and tortured. So, <clears throat> so the nationalization is an open question because I think also Bhutto went after certain people, uh, certain industrialists whom he didn't have personal relationships with. So, you know, for instance, in the in the in the shipping industry, or in uh, you know certain areas, he leaves alone, and certain areas he goes after it, irrespective of the fact. And that, as you, as an economist, would say that what the benefits are, what also happens in this uh, 
in this process, and I'll talk about it from a labor perspective, is one is sort of the bureaucratization of the management, which also leads to a certain kind of corruption in terms of uh, access to certain resources for a for the bureaucracy or the people in his own sort of uh, uh, political party and to control labor because he had this kind of taste of contestation from labor who had actually supported him to come into power but then he crushes them he starts giving various kinds of concessions you know labor leaders are sent as labor uh, attaches abroad or people are given money or a lot of extra people are uh, given employment in industries where you didn't need it, right? So there is a corruption of, so that they could be their people's party's labor cadres. So there is a corruption of the labor, uh, uh, of the management and of the labor movement as well that Bhutto does to manipulate it politically to be in its form. None of that works because also what happens is that some of the people who were there, then of course he also does is that uh, he has these relationships and uh, uh, Middle East was opening up. So a lot of labor also goes there and gets this kind of, you know, it's kind of a safety wall because you can't give employment people here. So a kind of a safety wall happened. A lot of people go into the construction sector in UAE and Saudi Arabia. That is the time that it opens up to buy jello phenomena. But you're right. I mean, it's a mixed bag. Uh, and I think partly it could have been successful uh, in certain areas. Uh, but uh, I mean, but he goes after banks, he goes after uh, 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 the shipping industry, he goes after text, uh, uh, text, not textile, but other kinds of food processing areas. So it's a kind of a mixed bag. And I think the bureaucratization of the industry, of the management, uh, led to a lot of problems. He goes uh, after education as well, but you know, grammar school and HSN are left, but others are, you know, so he does all kinds of, uh, you know, there are there are ways in which certain people are allowed to yeah. stay on. Cherry picking which, which yeah. ones to target basically. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that I've given you an adequate answer. You know, no, no, uh, uh, that was perfect. But I, that got me thinking about on another tangent also, uh, is that similar criticism is meted out to Bhutto's land reforms also. So, um, and, and since we're uh, rushing towards the end of the show, we just have 30 minutes. So it was a lovely conversation. I wanted to hear more from you, but uh, my last question to you would be about land reforms. And Bhutto is often criticized for, you know, sort of nationalizing land, which uh, did not belong to people he knew. And like you said, uh, do you think that, you know, um, similar sort of selective cherry picking of, uh, of families and people he wanted to target um, also made, you know, the land reform process to suffer? The, I, I said I'll be honest. I don't know about all the uh, uh, ceilings and uh, and and the particularities of the land reform. But one is clear, and I actually my earlier work um, was in Egypt, and I did work in a rural area. This is I'm talking about late early nineties, and there also I studied some of the land reform that you Nasser did, which is sort of you know, and eventually you find out that there are always loopholes and gaps in these programs. I'm just giving an analogy of Nasir, but it, I think it's also true of the land reform because there was a small land reform in, in the Ayub era as well. But uh, in the Bhutto era as well, the issue is of various kinds of kinds of land holding, you know, whether it is uh, rain fed, whether it's, uh, it's canal fed, you know, so they, they, that kind of thing. And then also ceilings for a person, not as a family. So there are various kinds of loopholes that a lot of people could either declare their land as being barani or sort of not very productive, or they could sort of distribute it under various names within their own family. So I don't think the, I mean, some some land was distributed to peasants, uh, and but uh, but uh, the the they may not have been very productive, or the impact of his land reforms was not very entrenched amongst people, and a lot of the large land holders especially in places like Sin, yeah, because they care. In, in, in Punjab, although in East Punjab, it's a very different issue. They did uh, have a good land reform and the productive land, especially in canal fed areas or areas that, that have uh, water, 
uh, you don't need like thousands of acres or you know a hundred acre in Gujramala will be very productive for a middle or a slightly upper middle peasant, right? To grow rice or something like this. In uh, in Sindh, a lot of that land was not distributed because people could sort of opt and say either they, I mean, there were loopholes, and it was not as successful as I uh, as in 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 Punjab as well. It may not have been as successful, but Punjab, the especially central Punjab, the land holdings had already been uh, 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 curtailed to a large degree, and the productive size of a good sort of middle in middle farmer was different. In in NWFP, there was a lot of problems as well, very big problems, because uh, there actually in 1972-73 in Hashnagar, there were, there were movements to occupy land, especially in the Swat area and Hashnagar area. And there also there was a different kind of politics, but uh, of the left, uh, with Mazdoor Kisan party being involved there. But we'll, we'll, we, we don't have time for that. Uh, All right, what sir. I'm trying to say is that the land reforms yeah. had mixed results because there were loopholes and people could retain uh, large, large holders, large uh, holders could retain a lot of their land. Sir, thank you very much for clarifying a lot of things and setting the record straight, especially when it uh, comes to the history of uh, early communism in Pakistan in the 50s and the 60s. I would have loved to carry this conversation further, but uh, because of the paucity of time, we'd have to stop here. Uh, I had more questions to ask you, but uh, thank you for very clear and uh, targeted and unambiguous answers. I hope my audience would have learned a lot from you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'd be signing off. Uh, thank you very much for joining and uh, joining the podcast. Asad Ijaz Bhatko, Neha TV pe, new wave global page, Azad Thank you very much. For that,